I'm just going to ask a couple of questions to get things rolling. I want to turn the floor over to you folks who have a chance to ask questions. And one of the things I was thinking about watching this a second time is you're making a film where the lead actor also wrote the script. Mm -hmm. Is that a special challenge as a director going in that, um, to be, I don't know, on an equal footing? I mean, how do you work with somebody who has created the piece and maybe knows things about it that you don't know? Well, I think it, it's really important as a director um, that it's your, you're in charge. It comes with the title. So often we think we have to present uh, uh, an image of ourselves or establish our power. You know, I'm gonna stand. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see people, can't see. Um, uh, and it comes with the title. And the actors know, you decide where they go. The actors know that you decide what they wear. The actors know that you make all the decisions in the end of the day. It comes with the title. So Jeff, um, it wasn't precious. Now there are writers that are precious. And when they're precious and they're attached, those aren't professional, that's not professional. In the amateur levels, it's just commonplace. Oh, I really loved it, and this and that. In the professional world, especially when you've done a lot of TV, and it has to be 41 minutes and 30 seconds, there's not a lot of room for precious. If it's fat, it comes out. If it doesn't work, it comes out. Um, and when writers are precious about their words, and they, they white knuckle their material, and yet you're in a profession where you have to hand off your work to others to make something of it, um, it's just a mistake. Uh, just like in golf, there's mistakes. Just like in baseball, there's mistakes. Uh, a mistake for us would be attachment. Jeff was not precious at all. Now this, now this is, to me, a, a really fine example of an independent film made for a very tight budget. And yet, you know, to me, it's the equivalent of any film you would see in a theater. I mean, we hear about budgets of $200 million, whatever, and yet you produced a film for, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 350000 It's still a lot of money, $300,000. Uh, 350, we are a little under 350 now with all the post-production and we, the music and stuff that we end up playing with afterwards. But, I mean, it's a lot of money. But in today's world of making movies, it's not. and. That was very much behind the company, Grand River Productions, that Melissa, Jeff, and I started. A couple of years earlier, I think it was 2014, um, I directed a, a short film, a 44-minute film, uh, that we shot in eight hours. Uh, and it won a lot, it won Hollywood, it won New York, it won festivals all, all over the world, actually. And that was, I was executive producing a TV show for uh, ABC called Secrets and Lies, and we we're in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I've been, I've executive produced five or six TV shows. And I get frustrated when we waste money. I get frustrated in the amount of time it takes. I get frustrated, especially as an actor who's raised a family in my 40 years of doing it. I've raised kids. I've got kids with sore throats. I got kids going to the hospital. I got a wife who's pregnant and going to deliver a baby any minute. Let's go. Let's not make anything precious of it. We're all pros. Let's show up, do our job, trust our instincts, listen to one another, be polite, and let's move. Let's not spend money we don't need to spend. So many, how many filmmakers do we have here? How many? Boom, boom, boom. Great. The idea of pushing a boulder uphill to do your art is nonsensical. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Why? put an impediment between you and your easel? Why put an impediment between you and the guitar and your music that you write with? And yet films have this gigantic, we need all this money, we need all this, we need all that. Well, we proved you don't. Um, and we could have shot it for less, except for Jeff wanted to. He said, let's just get a couple Sony A7S's and let's just shoot it and show it to people on their phone. And I said, you're Jeff Daniels. I can't make that movie without people going, what the heck, Busfield? Why didn't you shoot it on something else? So I made a producer of a guy who owned a bunch of camera equipment and he let me have it. You give somebody a title they can go on IMDb with, 
they'll give you something. You're gonna make somebody an executive producer for a certain amount of money, you give them a title, they'll give you the money. I get to go on IMDB, maybe one day I'll see my name. You're probably gonna lose money, like investing in the theater. They may not make any money, but they're gonna get a chance to be a part of something that other people can see that will live forever. This isn't going anywhere. This will be around a long time. Because it's the nature of film, it, it, it lasts a long time. So, where does all the money go on these movies that cost so much money? When you can make a movie like this for three hundred thousand dollars, just look at the credits. I mean, the credits are going to tell you those are all union laborers uh, that are working on that film. And if you look at an Avengers movie, you're going to see a stunt. The stunt unit is bigger than the main unit. Uh, people have two and three, and then they got to kill all the uh, bad guys. And sometimes they're monsters, and they're you know. You have all that, the money goes into the production, uh, uh, not a, necessarily on screen. A lot of money's wasted on what doesn't go on screen. Often what happens is if you're gonna spend, here's what happened. Let's say I make a TV show for ABC and it's $3 million an episode. The Teamsters are gonna say, well, if you're gonna spend $3 million an episode, then I want eight drivers, seven days, five days a week, a six day in case they gotta come in and move trucks on a Saturday, 12 hour day guarantee. And you're like, no, no. <laughs> and they say, all right, you don't get to make a movie then. Because we're the Teamsters, we can shut you down. We'll make, you can't have a truck, you, you need trucks for cameras, you need trucks for sound, you need trucks for prop, you need trucks for set decoration. We didn't have any trucks. You know, you gotta find your way around it. You know, if you have a lot of locations, it's gonna cost a lot of money. You gotta move trucks. If you have a lot of stunts, if you have a lot of action, if you got a lot of computer graphics, it's gonna cost a lot of money. A lot of the $200 million movies have that. They have all those things you see in the end credits that come with a whole bunch of people. We chose to play, we have theaters, small cast, small crew. His son did the music. My son was the director of photography. His other son did, uh, 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 was a camera operator. Melissa Gilbert, the great Melissa Gilbert, uh, found the train station, designed the sets. I did the costumes. I said to the actors, meet me at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. What do you think? And you can talk to them about it. And director wants to be there for that. You don't just turn it over to a costume designer and then not show up when the actor and the costume designer have their meeting. And do you need a costume designer? Are you building costumes? If you're not building costumes, you don't need a costume designer. If you have six people, you're the director. If you can't do the costumes, you're worthless. If I can't do the costumes for everybody in this room and do it all in a couple hours by going boom, 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 then I'm not a pro, right? Why do we need all those people? And that's where money will go. On the big features, you need them. You need drawings. You need drawings of, of, of Circe. You need drawings of... Uh, you know, Jon Snow, you need with a thing and you need the guy with the blue eyes, you know, the Ice King or whatever. That requires a costume designer to bring all that because the director's prepping. Uh, small films, films for you guys, the filmmakers here, don't go big. Why push a boulder uphill? Yeah. And I would think with the smaller group of people working on the film, they would all feel much more vested in what they're working on than if you were on a vast crew of hundreds of people. Yeah, there's. I've got. I've shared film credits with uh, Martin Scorsese. Never met him. Uh, he acted in Quiz Show. All the people in Quiz Show, I never met him. Uh, I'm in. I, I work. I'm in the Russell Crowe. I'm in very small. I wanted to work with Naomi Watts. I'm in the Roger Ailes movie. I just worked with Naomi and the woman who played my wife. So there is a detachment. But here, we were able to run, I rehearsed it like a play. We shot it in seven days total. That includes the New York day. I rehearsed it, we cast it in September or August. Thomas was cast, he's never acted before. The boy who played uh, uh, Kenneth had never acted before. Was a stage manager at Jeff's Theater, but Jeff loved him. So. Jeff came to us in the spring. He said, I want to do guest artists as a movie. Melissa and I said, okay, great, let's get to work. Jeff wrote the screenplay. By June, July, we talked about casting. August, we cast. 
We read everybody at Jeff's house. Thomas got the part. And then I left uh, to go work, and we weren't going to shoot till Christmas. The reason it's a Christmas movie is we could only shoot at that time of year with Jeff. We had all the Christmas, the town decorated. Embrace it or take it down. If you take it down, you got to spend the money. Embrace Christmas. Make it a part of the story. And that's, that's what we did there. Um, I said run the lines uh, a lot. You two guys meet and run lines. Don't act it. Don't make choices. Don't plant tapes. To your average amateur actor, they think that their acting depends on how they say their lines. Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you they That's what they practice at home. I watched tonight. I loved watching it here. Um, those guys were never thinking that. You really get a sense that they're just talking and listening. And I stress fundamentals, basic, simple fundamentals, just like sports, just like cooking, just like anything we do really well. The simpler version is the best. Listen and react. Listen and react. Those are the fundamentals of acting. Those are what make good actors. Not who you know, not uh, uh, what you look like. You've got to be able to do those things or you won't get to work with really good people. So I left him, Thomas, to run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. Um, I forgot the, the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, what I'm thinking as you're talking is really all you need for a movie are a couple of good actors talking and listening and, and talking about things that matter. You don't need all kinds of background stuff or special effects. You don't need any. No, you could have one person. You don't, in your know, documentaries, there's a million ways to express what you want to do. And often it's logistics will decide it. I want to tell a story about this, but if I make it too big, it's not a big, this is not a big money maker. It's just not. It's a 75 minute small film. I did not get paid, Jeff did not get paid, Melissa did not get paid, everybody else got paid. We probably won't make any money. If it was to do well, we might get a little bit of our money back, but I doubtful. Um, uh, this was not that movie. That $200, $200 million movie, that's got to make a billion dollars, right? You have, the, you, you can't make a small film with that. You have to be smart filmmakers. If you want to make a movie and you don't have any money, don't put things in there that are going to cost a lot of money. Here we stayed in one spot mostly. Uh, we added the, the uh, exterior stuff from the play. We added the gas station. We added New York. We added New York four days before we shot it with two days left in the movie, in Michigan. I said to Jeff, what are you doing when we leave? He said, I'm going to New York. I said, we're going back to New York. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Why don't, we, why don't we open the movie in New York? Because I need scope and I don't have it. I need something to set up the small Midwestern town. What can we do? And Jeff, we wrote it right there uh, in the middle of the night. Everything was shot at night, right? So we started work at five at night. We finished work at five in the morning every day. Uh, and Jeff went away into a corner and came back and said, what about we da 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 and we were done. That's how much you can go, one, two, three, go, without pushing a boulder uphill. You can create a scene, shoot it, and it didn't cost anything. We did get permits in New York. We did pay for a few people, but I don't think it cost more than 1500 bucks to shoot all the New York stuff, right? Freedom. Freedom comes without having a lot of people saying, hey, I paid for that. Doug Lyman uh, directed Born Identity, directed Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Jumper, uh, so many great films. Uh, he made a film called The Wall with John Cena. Be and it was a reaction to a studio executive telling him to change the music in Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He didn't want to change the music. And the guy said, "If when you pay 40 million for a movie, you can decide the music. And he didn't like it. He still doesn't like that beat in the movie, uh, uh, the music that's in the movie. He wanted to make something that was without having to answer to a lot of people, which is what we wanted to do. Question now. Yeah, you gave some great advice for people uh, 
he gave some great advice for uh, actors and people coaching actors and things. Your son was in was the DP. Jeff's son did music. Are they coming from the LA programs? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, uh, my son Willie uh, is. Uh, these are their professionals. Uh, uh, Willie, my son Willie is uh, went to Cal Arts. And then he spent five years with me when I produced uh, Mind Games, a uh, bunch of shows. The, and without a trace, uh, all the short ends on the film were what he used to make his student project. Then he had to pay his dues. He was with me for about five years, so he learned everything, top to bottom, from what the executive producer sees. And I was in charge. It was my show. I was running these shows. So he got a chance to see everything, and now... Uh, he went to where he moved from New York. He became an assistant on a camera for uh, uh, some commercials. And now he's Chanel's number one director of photography. Makes more money than God. Uh, when your kid buys you a dinner, that's the happiest moment in your life. Thank God all that college paid off. Uh, he did not come from an L.A. I don't know what the L.A. program is. Oh, I meant USC. Oh, UCLA. Uh, Cal Arts. Yeah, yeah, Tim Burton. So he, so he kind of did. So, so you can't really do it just from, from the practical side of it. You, you, I mean, even when it's your dad, you need the degree. No, I don't think you need the degree at all. Uh, Ben's got no degree. And look, Willie learned a lot. He's, in, he's learned at Cal Arts from so many great artists like Tim Burton, the guest teachers that they have, the amount of the pedigree of the students at that school is very high and the films they studied, but the education they got was great for him. I, I went to East Tennessee State for two years. They thought I was British. Uh, where are you from, London? It wasn't too hard for me to get parts and plays. Uh, I was there two years and then I went to Louisville as an apprentice, and then I was discovered in Louisville by a casting director for NBC who flew me to New York to read for Saturday Night Live. Didn't get it, uh, but I did get a movie and an agent that week. So. I, I think the cream always rises. There is, if you do, it's perspiration over inspiration in our business. I think I might have said that before. It's all about who works the hardest. Uh, and those that work the hardest get are the best. Glenn Close is a great actor. She's technically perfect. And she's not technically perfect because she came that way or because of who she knows or connections. Glenn is enormously proud of the fact that she was Mary Beth Hurt's understudy on Broadway. She paid her dues. And I've been in Bright Beach Memoirs. I was the standby for both the boys in that play. I didn't, you know, you don't get to go on. You don't get the Tony nomination. You get nothing. You're just there to learn and grow. And you spend a year watching other actors and being able to mimic them. Uh, there's nothing romantic about that. There's nothing good for your ego about that tremendous amount of gain technically and craft wise and that's what matters the most and you can get that anywhere yes see in in honor of the film i'm going to start with a quick joke it's uh, how many you know you change a light bulb jokes you know those yes. how many teamsters does it take to change a light bulb how many 20 you got a problem with that yeah, there you go <laughs> um, so i had a question for you but then you said something so i'm going to piggyback a second question my question for you was um, and this may be a different question what was and what is magic wand what was and what is your goal for this picture as the director, what are you hoping for? But you said something that I'm gonna add to, which is my question to you when you were talking about executive producer, give them something, they'll give you money. My question to you is, because I don't agree that if you work hard that you always get there because sometimes you're just not getting the right place at the right time, um, but how do you get or find the executive producer who'll give you those things when you're not Melissa, Jeff, Tim, how do you get that person? Oh, I'm taking the money. Um, I think you got to find, I think you, there's a, there's a, it wouldn't take but probably about 20 minutes to go look and find out who financed 20 films. You can go online, look it up, drop them a line, send them a script. These are people that like to finance. They're, they're out there. There's a lot of them. You just got to go get them. And to answer the point about hard work, you can't get there without hard work. Agreed. You, you don't, hard work won't necessarily get you the finish line if you don't have if you don't have the goods, but you'll find out if you have the goods or not. 
the, the, the sad thing is when you see a lot of people that don't have the goods but don't do the work. And they say, I could be an actor. I had an ex-wife that would say that. I could be an actor. I'd say, picture, resume. I could be an actor, I could do that. Picture, resume. Are you a professional? Can you really do it? Have you taken a class? Have you ever acted? No, but I could do it. Okay. I'll see ya. I'm going to Melissa now. No. <laughs> Not true. That was your. That never happened. But I'm bummed. Another question. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See? Uh, um, the only thing that Melissa, Jeff, and I would love to do right now is get Don Clark his money back about 350,000 plus the music if we stay with this music that music's expensive it's about 85,000 for that that uh, <coughs> the Christmas song that we start and end with plus we play it twice so it's 85 twice if it goes if we sell if not we'll pull it out and we'll let Ben record some we'll find some in public domain if we don't want to pay that money I would love for somebody to buy it was our hope is that somebody would come along and say here's three million dollars you know, there's your money and everybody got paid, go. But it didn't happen, it hasn't happened yet. We do have offers, but nobody's come with a minimum guarantee. We do have a very attractive offer on the table, which looks best to us. I can't really talk about it now because then you go, I thought it was that. But, uh, but that we do have one out there. Jeff can't promote the film because of To Kill a Mockingbird until the fall when he leaves. And it's got a Christmas theme to it. So we think it'll be November, it'll find a home. So right now we're being very patient. When was it made? This was, was it made? This was made, uh, what is it, 19, 2019. Uh, we finished the movie last August. And so we finished, we finished editing it and, and putting the finishing touches on it last August, September. Uh, we finished shooting it. The one day in New York was like New Year's, just before New Year's, it was the 28th of, of uh, December or something like that, we finished the movie. We shot it between the 20th and the 28th. Um, yeah, it was that, that year before. So 2017, that, I guess that would have been, we shot it 2017, edited it 2018, and released it to festivals in 2018. Question. Uh, Go ahead. So um, I, I think you're gonna get their money back. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, I, I think one of the ways that you're going to do it is, is, is to basically have the nerve to say this is better than dinner with Andre, and more important. Mm -hmm. It's, it's better than dinner with Andre, and it's more important. Is there a second choice? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. It's, I, important, it's an important film on this level that you're, 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 dis you're discussing it. And I was wanting to know where the title came from, and. Um, are you really that invested in the, in the, in the, in the, how the, the questions have been asked? Are you really that invested in the opening montage? And are the songs that important to the story? The, song, the songs aren't. I think it's important that we see the, rom the romance of where he's coming from and where the boy wants to go. I do like the New York element of it because it gives a scope. Movies need scope. Yeah. Filmmakers, when you go to make a movie, you need the wide shots to earn the tight shots. You need the why. Let the audience watch. Let them lean in. Let them watch the behavior. Then punch in when you need to make a point. Punch in when you need to, when you need inserts. That's what earns those tight shots or the wide shots. So don't be afraid to get wide. Don't be afraid to let scenes play wide. And don't think that the scene doesn't need to play at a good rhythm in a wide shot. And don't let anybody tell you you're only gonna use it for a couple of seconds. In TV, they, they'll say that to you all the time. Set up a wide shot. Some people go, we're never going to use it. Mm. And I go, how do you know you're never going to use it? What do you mean? I'll decide if we're going to use it or not. The scene might play better, or the audience needs to lean in. Nothing's worse than a lot of close-ups. Yeah. You lose value on what's important. It's a chance for a director to write. Get the audience to lean in when they move in, when they need to see a moment happen. Uh, what are your tightest sizes? Um, some of the tightest sizes in the movie is, is on Mary and, and Kenneth when the woman comes in at the end. The angel that Jeff wrote, you know, just one of the last things he wrote, is I said we need to start having people show up so the 545 will have value. 
So he wrote the guy delivering the boxes. And then he wrote the woman that came in, he wrote the line, I'm not sorry, which I love he wrote that scene. Um, boom, that's his turn. I had to cover the turn. When the kid, when Jeff berates him on his play and turns and walks away, Jeff's out of focus that whole time. All we are is on that kid in focus. And it's a wide shot, it's also a close up because we have a long lens on. Long lens is the depth of field. You don't see things go out of focus on a long lens. Mm. So we shot, we got back as far as we could so we didn't have to worry about holding Jeff in focus and let the kid make his transition. So we had a close up, but we want, I wanted Jeff in the shot. Mm -hmm. So, mm. yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you uh, use storyboards at all? I use storyboards when I shoot action. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do storyboard if I have lots of pieces. If I've got um, a big setup day that I don't want to leave things behind, mm -hmm. inserts, uh, you know, things like that, I'll write those down. Storyboards for action because those, those you know, uh, you're not necessarily the director of that stuff as far as you got a lot of elements, safety, you got a lot of. Uh, stunt people that are going to come in. Yeah. You got a lot of people coming in, and you want to get everybody to be able to look at something, and that's where storyboards can really matter. Not every day I don't do storyboards. I want to close up here, or that, there. Uh, you know, in the beginning, when I first started directing, uh, you know, 150 episodes of television ago, I wrote every little thing down, uh, and then I'd fall asleep. I wake up in the middle of the night, panic, and then I would write down more of what it was. <laughs> Nowadays, I'm like. I watch the rehearsal, I move them around, and I go, okay, pip, 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 yeah. and we're out. But that's just, again, it's the perspiration, it's years of experience. I will not, I would not enter into an action sequence without storyboards. Gotcha. Because you wanna be able to say, go do me a favor uh, to your AD, first AD, go shoot this stuff. Take B camera, the second camera, and go shoot uh, all these little shots. Go shoot this and that. I need all these before the end of the day. I'll keep the camera in the second AD and I'll shoot the scene with the actors. But go out and pick up every little piece you can that become valuable. That stuff you want to storyboard. Yes, sir. Gosh. Um, one, thing, one thing that I really, really, really liked is that you didn't move the camera for the sake of moving the camera. You know, you didn't, you weren't zooming, you weren't panning around, you weren't doing anything that was taking away from the action. You know, and that, that, shows, that shows experience to me. You know, so many of the young filmmakers nowadays are so into all the, all the shots and the different things you can do with, you know, cameras being so easy to move around. You know, you didn't, you know, you didn't mount a camera to have a train go over it. You know, you didn't do a lot of things that, you know, maybe your son wanted to do. You know, maybe they're on the editing room floor, but at the same time, you know, you, you stayed with, you know, you stayed with the actors and you didn't bounce all over the place. You know, it made it much more pleasant to watch. Even your, you know, B-roll in New York, you know, the camera was still, yeah. you know, it wasn't moving around, it wasn't panning. You know, it was something that I noticed immediately. And as it, you know, as the movie progressed, I realized that, well, someone's making this that has got some experience. <laughs> you know, someone knows what they're doing because, you know, you've seen all the, you know, all of the crazy stuff that's going on now that to me, you know, ruins a lot of good stories. You know, and you didn't let that happen, so I was, I was very excited about that. Thank you. Um, uh, Ed Zwick, who produced and created 30-some, directed Courage Under Fire, Glory, Legends of the Fall, um, he would say to us on 30-some, and we all became, a lot of us became directors from that, they encouraged it. He said, the actors move the camera on that show, and I, I like it. Then I worked for Bruckheimer on Without a Trace, and he was just keep moving and stay low. And I said, no, Jerry. <laughs> We're not just gonna do random movements like you do on CSI, because this is a show about living people that are missing. It's not make it dark, put the Bruckheimer sheen on, and then coast in low mode constantly. That was not that show. There are shows in TV, especially with the amount of fire and you know medical shows, where they want you moving all the time. They want the camera moving all the time, just random. And that's mostly because the scripts are pedestrian. You know, they're, it's, they have the same script that they did on CSI Miami 
they're now doing on Chicago Fire. I mean, it just constantly, they're pedestrian. And you read a network script, a procedural cop or doctor show, and you kind of want to blow your brains out. Uh, and I'm sure Bruckheimer does too. I mean, he goes, I oh, know it's crap, but, but Jerry is all technical. That's why he is the king of two-star movies that last forever. Yes, ma'am. Jiffy, uh, that was the real Jiffy plant. Uh, Melissa, I wish she was here uh, because she could tell you about getting it. Uh, and, and the guy who owns it, the real Jiffy plant is in Chelsea. It's about five minutes from where Jeff lives. And we lived about 20 minutes up the road. Uh, but she went and got the guy, Howdy is his name. Uh, and he said, you want the Christmas lights on? No, but we did not pay them. No. We thanked him in the credits. Yes. I grew up in Michigan, and I went to Michigan State, so I, I know Chelsea. Um, I just wanted to ask, is this going to be an ongoing thing with you, Melissa, and Jeff? I saw Grand River Productions. Is that based in Chelsea or down in Detroit, and are you going to keep doing other projects? I hope so. Well, Grand River Productions is a Michigan corporation. Um, we uh, have uh, projects in development right now, so we're, we're going to continue moving forward. Yeah, we love working together, and we hang out together, and, you know, we end up over there. We were over at Jeff's just the other, uh, must have been his day off. It was Monday. We were at Jeff's on Monday and talking about what's next. So, yeah, and what to do with this and what to do with the executive producer. He's not going to get his money back. <laughs> well, I kind of had two questions. Do you actually have projects? Are you planning any projects in the area, like the Tri-City? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, no, we're not planning anything uh, necessarily in the tri-state area. However, uh, I mean that we're planning on producing. However, I will be going back to um, Law and Order SVU as a director. I acted on the show. Mariska was on 30-something, and it's a show I really love to do, despite the, there's been a million of them. Uh, I love all those people. I loved acting on it, uh, and so I will go back to that. Um, is the only thing that's sort of New York, and I'm on a show that got picked up, a pilot that got picked up that I'll be acting on, that they keep changing the title on. The Untitled Jason Cato Show, I'll be on that uh, this coming season. I worked and, on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I worked through. Yeah. So, for one more question. Sir. I have a question for like, oh, people who are starting, you know, they're, 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 they're <laughs> Um, what advice would you give someone who's basically in the beginning stages who has a passion to do, wants to be a filmmaker, does, you know, does, does writing, <laughs> wants to do, does directing, like, what would you give advice? Great, um, great question. Uh, it's a great last question, and not only just because my train leaves in 24 minutes. Um, <laughs> here's what I want to say, and I'd say it to, I wish there were more students here. That's a great question. Everybody, that's the question. There's one thing you can do, and that's get up tomorrow and do it. And jump in the back seat of a car, put two actors in the front seat, hopefully they drive well and can drive and talk. <laughs> let, them, let them improvise an argument, even if they're not actors. Get one camera on the back seat looking at the driver, and one camera on the other side of the back seat looking at the passenger. We call them French overs, don't know why. Uh, but you go ahead and shoot that and then edit it. And then go out the next day and shoot something else and edit that. That's the only way you're going to get it. We work every day. Spielberg works every day. Ridley Scott works every day. The, everybody that makes movies that are professionals, that we work all the time. And that's when you get good. Baseball players play every day. You got kids that want to be baseball players, go in the basement, swing the bat 500 times until your hands bleed. Maybe you'll be able to catch up to a 90 mile an hour fastball. If you don't do that, you'll never make it. That answers my thing about hard work. You'll never get there without hard work. You, you do it. We did this movie in our downtime. This is insane to not get paid to do that movie, but it's what we do. I won't let up on learning, and I won't let up on growing. How about Tomorrow, you got to do it. This is a theater in Ridgefield, a prospector, it's all special needs children it's that are known across the country. The backers are the wealthiest. Hedge fund in the country, Bridgewater. And 
Evan, you do a premiere there. With the, they already get publicity. The Yankees, everybody are all involved with this theater. You doing a premiere there, actually, you probably make half your money in one night. <laughs> <laughs> that might be really good. There's also Fathom, which does the one night events that we think might, might be the best play for us. But I like that. One last, anything, anybody? It will not, I don't think it's playing here. It's playing out in Long Island and it's playing out in Massachusetts. Uh, and we're down to our last few. And we'll play in Michigan at a big fundraiser in the fall. I yep. guarantee we'll play somewhere this fall. This was educational, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so Support this program. This is great. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everybody. God bless. I'm going to run. I'm really sorry. <laughs>